Today on Carolina Week, another lockdown. For the second time in 16 days, students and faculty shelter in place because of a gun on campus. The impact on the community and the call for action. Plus, alert system scrutiny, the growing demand for improvements to the Carolina community. And politics at play, from the U.S. Vice President to UNC Young Republicans, what both sides are proposing to end gun violence. Carolina Week starts right now. From the UNC Hussman School of Journalism and Media, connecting Carolina's campus and community, this is Carolina Week. Welcome to Carolina Week. I'm Sarah Choi. And I'm Stephen Schlink. Well, again, another lockdown. Just over two weeks after a deadly campus shooting shocked the Carolina community, we once again faced a lockdown. And here's what we've learned. Just before 1 p.m. last Wednesday, an alert Carolina went out, once again stating that, quote, an armed and dangerous person is on or near campus. According to police, the suspect walked into Alpine Bagel in the student union and pulled out a gun, but shots were never fired. The suspect was taken into custody just a few miles off campus around 45 minutes after the university gave the all clear. This came just 16 days after UNC's first lockdown of the semester. Remember, on August 28th, police say a PhD student shot and killed a professor in Caudill Laboratories. We are continuing to press for answers. Where's the weapon? What was the motive? How did the shooter get a gun? The university tells us the weapon has not yet been found, but has not responded to our other questions. As a reminder, we here at Carolina Week have made the decision to not say the shooter's name or show his face, but we will say that the suspect is currently being held at the Orange County Detention Center. And Carolina Week reporter Mayor Famit joins us now. Mayor, you've spoken to many in the community who are just trying to process it all. Steve and I did. I talked to students, faculty, even some parents. A week later, some are still shocked. Others told me they are fearful of this becoming a new normal, but initially, many had the same reaction. First thing I was just thinking was like, I can't believe it's happening again, you know? Here we go again. So soon. It's like, again. But frankly, the first thing that came to my, that came into my head on top of that was like, this is America. When I was getting my lunch, Alpine, and then, everything it happened like he started they were arguing and then he put out the gun and we all started running i sort of realized how practiced we'd become and that also made me angry because it was it felt almost like routine and that was a scary thought to me i think it's really important for people who may let's say underestimate the significance of that event because it wasn't a shooter it was a person brandishing a weapon but that doesn't necessarily mean that it meant something less to the people who were in that space in that moment or who have life experiences that shape the way they perceive it definitely a lot of different perspectives i also had an interesting conversation off camera with a couple who told me their daughter is an employee on campus who was on lockdown while at the same time their granddaughter was on campus at a nearby elementary school so it was not just tar heels on campus impacted but the broader community around us definitely something the community as a whole felt mayor thank you sarah lots of people just trying to figure out how to move forward Absolutely. Mayor and Stephen, it's clearly hard to make sense of these lockdowns for all of us here at UNC and for international and exchange students. This all feels especially surreal. That's what they told us when our team spoke to some of those students near Alpine Bagel. UNC has more than 2,000 international students enrolled from more than 100 countries. After having two gun incidents back to back, there are a lot of mixed feelings that these students in our community are experiencing just as they're settling into Chapel Hill. And we don't really experience this in India so much because this is not very, um, not a very common thing to see. And honestly, like coming to America, you would expect there to be a level of sophistication. I am having such a good time here and I wouldn't want an issue like gun violence to ruin what is an amazing opportunity. Plus also told us that she immediately started searching for flights to head back home to London. But as you heard her say, she has reconsidered after her panic settled. These lockdowns have been scary. Absolutely, very clearly. And it's just so sad to know that some of these students feel like they have to go back home just to be safe. Absolutely.
As we've been spending time talking to Tar Heels, one student's experiences really stood out to me. Isabel Potts was once a K-12 teacher, but actually left her job as a teacher due to her fear of school shootings. She's now a master's student at the university. Here's a look at her story. When Isabel Potts was in lockdown on Wednesday, she had... The feel of impending, like, just really, like, my heart started racing. I started getting very anxious, very stressed. That was how she felt a week ago. And now, she's back in a UNC classroom. But it's not her first time. One of the reasons that I stopped teaching, and my family wanted me to stop teaching, was because of all of the school shootings at K-12 through schools in the U.S. And so I thought by coming here, I was actually coming to a safe environment. Potts is pursuing her Master of Public Health. But before that, she was a teacher. Her reason for leaving? The fact that I'm coming back to this university that was always a safe place for me. And so far in my first month, it's just been you know, so traumatic is really, really difficult to deal with. And she doesn't walk this path alone. In a few weeks, her partner will start his postdoctoral studies in Caudill Lab. And it's so embarrassing to think that we were supposed to be starting this wonderful journey at my alma mater together. And, you know, there was a shooting on the same floor um, that he'll be working on in a few weeks. Potts doesn't want the door to shut on the conversations surrounding gun safety. It's really upsetting that this is happening on a campus that I love so much. I've grown up a Tar Heel. I've always been a Tar Heel, and I'm so proud that I'm here for my MPH, but it's just, um, you know, this is just a horrible way to begin this new journey. Students like Isabel are demanding change. And we're seeing more organizations come together to push for that change. One of these demands includes more timely alerts and more sensitive wording. This is among some of the demands from one student organization on campus. UNC's Black Student Movement posted its demands for changes in the university's safety measures. The organization is also calling for alerts in different languages and relative location of threats. So we are not trying to get the university to push things out quicker than they can confirm them. However, the a simple solution to misinformation and combating that um, would be sending out, even if it's the same information, letting people know what's currently going on, what we know, and what we don't know, because those large gaps of time, it's not that nothing's being said, it's that nothing's coming from a true source. The alert system sent five texts from three numbers during last week's lockdown. The university did decline to comment on the Alert Carolina messages during both lockdown situations. As a reminder, last semester we did report on the Alert Carolina system. This is what the Director of Emergency Management and Planning told us about the process when we talked to him in March. Take a listen. Someone from Campus Safety uh, is given the notification of the incident. Uh, and they determine whether or not uh, the current situation warrants a notification to campus based on our documented procedures. And from that process, then those who have the authority to activate the system uh, will initiate that process to do so through getting the notice pushed out to the campus community. UNC March for Our Lives is facing criticism from internet users after posting a video of one of its organizers yelling into the camera during last week's lockdown. Take a look. I am pissed, I am angry, and I demand change. The organizer, Luke Diazio, got in front of a lecture hall of anatomy students sheltering in place in Coker Hall to create the now viral video. After it was posted on Instagram, the video quickly received backlash from some students, saying it made them feel unsafe and uncomfortable. Now, March for Our Lives is responding to the criticism. In an interview with Carolina Week, Diazio said he is sorry and wants to do better in the future. We've had some technical difficulties with the video, but we still wanted to play you some of the audio. Take a listen. We've seen decades of inaction, and it can be really tempting to try new different things, and you know, mistakes will happen. And I feel like the video, you know, could have been done a lot better. And while these organizations are demanding change in one form, UNC students with varying political affiliations might be demanding change a little differently. Our Kristen Snyder spoke with some students on campus with a more conservative perspective. Take a look. 
We've seen calls for action, and while many agree there's a problem and a need to end gun violence to avoid tragedies, many can't agree on a solution. Uh, we partner with UNC March for Our Lives, UNC Students Demand Action, a number of state representatives uh, to really stand solidarity against this, this epidemic that's plaguing our whole entire country. UNC Democrats want to increase gun regulations like universal background checks and red flag laws. On the other hand, UNC conservative students have a different take. Both ordeals, I have felt like a sitting duck because it's just we're told to just sit down in your classroom, turn all the lights off, just be quiet and hide. And you're not allowed to protect yourself. You're not allowed to have anything to defend yourself. You're just going to sit here and be a sitting duck. All those measures, locks, perhaps firearms or security guards, and obviously training necessary for any would be teachers that would carry those or faculty advisors, things like that. Sensible approach. And in this case, I think that it's uh, my position, especially, that you should increase security presence and make sure that tragedies are mitigated as soon as possible after they've occurred because you're not going to you know, stop them all from happening. With the 2024 elections just around the corner, both political sides are attempting to find the solution to this pervasive problem. In Chapel Hill, I'm Kristen Snyder, Carolina Week. On the other side, Vice President Kamala Harris weighed in on the gun debate as well. Harris traveled to Greensboro where hundreds of students gathered on Friday to discuss political issues that affect college students. Harris acknowledged the recent gun violence in Chapel Hill and had students raise their hands to have experienced lockdown drills and occurrences. The vice president called for an assault weapons ban, universal background checks, and red flag laws, and said that courage from Congress and youth voter turnout are the keys to change. But when you vote, you have the ability to determine the future of our country in a way that might challenge a lot of people's notions about what is possible and who can possibly do it. Well, and speaking of voter turnout, we are just over a year away from the next general election. Yeah, Stephen, I actually checked last year's voter turnout and just under 60 percent of registered voters actually went out and voted. Wow. Definitely hope we can get those numbers up going into next year. Well, just on the other side of this quick break, we talk money, money, money. Less money in the state budget for casinos, but more money on your bill for tuition. It's possible. We'll be right back. I'm an extra dealer, and I'll be your sub today. Can you see anything different as a pill? No, no. You don't know? Fentanyl is being mixed into everything now. There is only one thing that will save somebody's life. That is naloxone nasal spray. Fentanyl is cheap, it's potent, and it's profitable. Why would drug dealers put a lethal dose of fentanyl in drugs if they know it's so harmful? Really just all about the money. I just didn't realize that one pill could change your whole life. More kitchen now. Thanks for staying with us. The North Carolina General Assembly is expected to vote on the state's budget later this week, coming nearly three months after the original deadline. No votes are expected on a bill that would have tied casinos and Medicaid expansion together. The authorization of four new casinos in North Carolina was originally included in the Senate's version of the budget. However, House Speaker Tim Moore said he did not have the votes in the House to pass that version. Earlier this week, House Republicans considered taking the casino clause out of the budget and putting it into an entirely separate bill with Medicaid expansion included. Democrats condemned the move, accusing Republicans of using Medicaid expansion as a, quote, political bargaining chip. And it was unclear if Senate leader Phil Berger would accept that framework. But last night, after a contentious and confusing day in the General Assembly, Berger and Moore announced an agreement on the budget. Casinos are out altogether, and Medicaid expansion will become law when the budget passes. The budget also includes raises for public school teachers and expansion of private school vouchers, as well as lower tax rates. 
And while we're talking money, let's talk about the money in your wallet. No tuition increase. That's what the UNC system president is pushing for when it comes to in-state undergraduate students. President Peter Hans told the Board of Governors he wants a tuition freeze in the upcoming 2024 to 25 school year. If approved by the board, the UNC school system will enter its eighth consecutive year without an increase in tuition throughout the 16 campuses in North Carolina. Low tuition is at the heart of our compact with the citizens in North Carolina. We can only be the university of the people if we offer an education the people of the state can afford. This comes after the university announced it would provide free tuition in the upcoming school year for in-state students whose families make less than $80,000 a year. An effort is underway to reach out to non-traditional students like community college transfers. This Friday from 3 to 5 p.m. C-STEP, the Carolina Student Transfer Excellence Program, will have its resource engagement fair and kickoff. The event will be held at the Blue Zone of Keenan Stadium, and the goal is to connect with those non-traditional students and incoming transfer students. CSTEP told us this will be a celebration. So we're bringing them together to, one, for the students who are here to celebrate them, to celebrate their progress. For those students who are still at the community college, we're wanting them to get on campus so they know that you are going to be here within a year or two, and you belong here and belong here they do. Fun fact, I'm actually a college transfer student. Well, that's so cool, Stephen. Community yeah. at Carolina is so important. It really is. And community events at Carolina are music to our ears, sometimes literally. <laughs> Chapel Hill Community Arts and Culture hosted the first ever Live at Legion community concert over the weekend. As you might imagine, the free event took place at Legion Road. The concert featured local band Mixtape Grab Bag, the band played the tunes from the 1970s up to today. And if you didn't catch it this weekend, don't worry, there may be more to come. This is our first time offering Live at Legion. Um, and so we're gonna see how it goes and kind of reevaluate and hopefully it's something that we continue. Upcoming community arts and culture events include Festival, which will take place every Saturday from October 14th to 28th, as well as the Thanks Plus Giving Food Truck Rodeo in November and the annual holiday parade in December. Well, a lot to look forward to, and honestly, these events, this week being the first official day of fall, actually looking forward to some of this fall weather. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And it kind of feels like fall out there this morning, stepping out the door. So let's head over to Carolina Week meteorologist Nick Boynton to see if this fall weather is finally upon us here to stay. Nick, how's it looking out there? Yeah, we are going to be seeing more of that fall weather in the morning times over the next several days. But first, we want to take a look at the tropics here. It is still hurricane season, so we want to take a look at some of these areas of interest. We got Nigel out there in the central Atlantic, not harming anyone but the fish out here, so we don't have to worry about him. But off the coast of Africa, a new wave developing here could become our next name, Tropical Storm, and we have a lot of time to watch that. So we'll, we'll be watching that over the next few days. This area of interest right here off the southeast coast, that's what we're paying attention to for our weekend weather. It could get a little messy around here as we head towards Saturday and Sunday, and we'll talk more about that here in a second. 81 degrees out there right now. It's, hot. it's not hot, but it's warm. 84 at 3 p.m. The big thing is that the humidity is down, so it doesn't feel as muggy out there when you step out the door. So 81, 84, 82 at 6 p.m., and that is going to be sticking with us here over the next several days. Now, our lows tonight getting a little chilly, 50s for most of the area, even some 40s out here in the mountains. So starting to get that fall chill, as we've been alluding to here in the morning times over the next several days. And that's because of this high pressure system that has been located over the East Coast for a couple of days now. Clockwise flow here around here, bringing dry weather and cool weather here for North Carolina. And that's going to stick with us here for a couple more days. But we want to watch here off the Southeast Coast, this low pressure starts to starts developing here off this stationary front, and that's going to move northward across North Carolina here Friday night into Saturday and Sunday. And you can see with our future cast what that sort of looks like, this low pressure developing, moving northward, and then wrapping that rainfall back across central North Carolina. And that means some higher winds, gusty winds, but the main threat will be heavy rainfall with this system. And you can see the Weather Prediction Center putting everyone, Char I mean, Durham, Raleigh, Chapel Hill, all the way down to Fayetteville and points eastward in that flash flooding risk. So we want to watch that heavy rainfall potential here going on your day on Saturday. 
Now, with their five-day forecast, beautiful weather here Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Catch me out on the pickleball courts because this is just beautiful stuff. I love being out there, and I love it when it's low humidity and warm out there. Saturday, though, windy, rainy. Stay inside on Saturday. Not a good day to be outside. Um, low to mid-70s for the rest of the remainder of the weekend into early next week. Now, stick with us. When we come back, we'll take a look at the exciting weekend ahead for Tar Heel Athletics. Even though we didn't grow up together, he's my favorite brother. Hey, sis. I'm the baby of the family, and he's the gentle giant. What you know about poor Georgia? Man, please, that's a classic. You know when they say people are a rare breed? Yeah, he's that. Sorry, I'll be back in a few hours. Don't worry, Shaq, you know I'm fighting. I know. Go get the football. Yeah. That was my favorite memory. He was always for you. This is a true story of me, Bridget Floyd, and this guy, George Perry Floyd Jr., my big brother. Welcome back to Carolina Wheat. We just heard about this week's weather. Let's look at the games. Absolutely no pressure at all, but of course UNC football is 3-0 and has another important game this weekend. So Sports Extra anchor Lee Jeffries joins us now with more. Lee, what's it looking like? They're on the road this weekend, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so current Tar Heel Nate McCollum is the ACC receiver of the week and former Heroes quarterback Sam Howell is also getting noticed for his on-field performance. The highlight of McCollum's performance against Minnesota came from this 46-yard touchdown pass to open the Tar Heel scoring. The Georgia Tech transfer would go on to pull in a career-high 15 receptions for 165 yards and a touchdown against the Golden Gophers, falling one reception short of tying the UNC single-game reception record. This also marks the third straight week that a UNC player has garnered ACC Player of the Week. The Heels will need McCollum to put up another explosive performance and UNC's first true road game Saturday night at Pittsburgh. Howell showed off his passing skills Sunday, involving 10 different targets, including UNC alum Deami Brown. With tight window throws like this to Logan Thomas, Howell commanded an 18-point comeback while accumulating more than 300 all-purpose yards. The UNC product showed off his big arm with several downfield throws, but also used his legs to pick up crucial first downs to continue the drive. Howell's biggest highlight would come off an insane 31-yard throw to Terry McLaurin early in the third quarter. Washington football fans are ecstatic to be 2-0. and Women's basketball coach Courtney Banghart has named seniors Deja Kelly and Alyssa Utsby as captains for the 2023-2024 season. Kelly, the San Antonio native, is UNC's sharpshooter. The guard averaged 16.5 points per game last season. She's ready to bring her competitive fire to the table as a leader for the team. Utsby is a forward from Rochester, Minnesota. Her biggest asset to the Heels is her rebounding. Utsby averaged 8.3 rebounds per game last season. Her passion and work ethic are clearly unmatched. Together, the first team All-ACC players and All-American honorable mentions look to lead the team to another deep tournament run. The Tar Heels men's soccer team took on UNCW Tuesday night at Dorrance, trying to get back into the win column. The Heels came in hot with a goal in the seventh minute by Martin Vichion off an assist from Quincy Armand. The Heels continued to put on the pressure, but were unable to net another goal in the first half. The Heels looked more alive at the start of the second half after Vichion rolled in his second goal of the night thanks to another assist by Armand. The Heels maintained solid control of the ball, not allowing UNC Wilmington any effective chances on goal. The Heels capped off their victory with a tap-in finish by Armand from a cross by Juan Cafaro. That gave Armand his fifth goal of the season. Turning to the women's team, Macy Bell celebrated her birthday as the ACC Defensive Player of the Week. Bell helped lead the Tar Heels to a shutout win against Virginia Tech on Friday. This is the fourth time she has earned the honor throughout her career. She becomes the third Tar Heel to win the award this season. The Tar Heels defense has been the heart of this year's team, holding opponents to 5.7 shots per game and a total of four goals through nine games. What do we like to say around here? It's the defense wins championships. Bell and her teammates face a tough test against the Virginia Cavaliers tomorrow, hoping to continue their undefeated streak. 
Following a victory against Virginia Tech, the Heels will bring their strong defense and new offensive superstars to Charlottesville, including freshman midfielder Evelyn Shores, who brought the game-winning strike Friday. The Heels will also bring a new field formation to boost offensive output. Tensions will be high after the Cavaliers' one-goal victory last year, but the Heels will fight to prove their new number one ranking is no fluke. Kickoff is set for 7 p.m. Tune into Sports Extra on Friday for a preview of another exciting weekend of Carolina athletics. We'll be right back. How do you know when you've made the right decision? It's the feeling you get in your gut. The one that tells you what's right or wrong. It's the one that says, sure, I can have a drink. Or the feeling that says, okay, I've been drinking. Now what? It's the voice inside you that says, I'm buzzed. Better leave the car when it's time to go. Plan ahead. Catch a sober ride. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Today, we face an unprecedented crisis. Tens of millions of refugees have been forced from their homes. But you can make a difference. Turn disruption and despair to hope and opportunity. Even small amounts make a big difference. Provide shelter, support, or jobs in your community. The more we understand, the greater sense of belonging we create. Act now. Visit supportcrisisrelief.org. Well, it's one of the most beloved movies of all time. Of course, we're talking about The Wizard of Oz. And can you believe it? It came out in 1939 and then automatically became an American classic. Now, more than 80 years later, a unique park on Beach Mountain is taking fans down the yellow brick road. Our Christian Phillips takes you there in this week's Covering Carolina. We're not in Kansas anymore. As a matter of fact, we're on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee here at Land of Oz, celebrating Autumn in Oz. The park features many famous scenes, including Dorothy's house, barn, and even her meeting with the charlatan Professor Marvel. How did you guess? Ha <laughs> ha! Professor Marvel never guesses. He knows. <laughs> and welcome to Oz. A short walk through the house and simulated tornado will bring you to the yellow brick road. You can watch shows performed by all the characters and even get to meet them as well. <laughs> but beware. Some areas may be off limits. Halt! Are you here to see the Wicked Witch of the West? Just make sure you don't have any water and you should be fine. Big water! Ah! You cursed brat! Look what you've done! I'm melting! Melting! It's not just the guests that enjoy being here. The cast members say they do too. Um, it is the most fun of anything I've ever done. I come an hour and a half from Ash County, which is West Jefferson, North Carolina, all the way to the tip top of Beach Mountain. Oh, it's awesome. It's my favorite job I've ever had. Um, meeting new people every day, creating experiences alongside the guests. It's the best opportunity I've ever been given and I try and never take it for granted. Land of Oz opened in 1970, but then closed 10 years later. Nowadays, it's only open for three weekends a year, hence Autumn at Oz. And there are certainly plenty of people coming to visit. Altogether, it's 24,000. Yeah, we completely sold out, so we were very surprised but very excited. Whether you're at Land of Oz for courage, a heart, a brain, a way back to Kansas, or just a good time, Autumn at Oz is certainly the place to be. Reporting for Carolina Week, I'm Christian Phillips. Just a great story, Chris, and I'm definitely going to have to go check that one out. Me as well. We might have to make it a trip. <laughs> yeah, trip right down that yellow brick road, as um, we said. <laughs> absolutely. That does it for this week's edition of Carolina Week. We'll see you next time. Have a good one.